So I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to today's conference on energy and environmental policy, uh, the quest for rationality. Uh, I'm Ricky Ravez. I'm on the faculty here at the law school, and I'm the director of the Institute for Policy Integrity, which is sponsoring this conference. We have an annual conference, and this is what we're doing this year. Uh, as you'll see from the program, we have a really distinguished group of policymakers, advocates, and experts from around the country uh, who will shed light, I know, uh, on a wide range of topics. Um, you've seen the participants in the panel. You, we will have two keynote speakers, uh, Cass Sunstein, uh, the former OIRA administrator, and Gina McCarthy, the former EPA administrator. Um, and this is an event that's co-sponsored um, with the wonderful student editors of the NYU Environmental Law Journal, who will also publish uh, whatever papers uh, come out of this conference. So for me, this is a really exciting event because it commemorates the 10th anniversary of policy integrity. Uh, we were founded in 2008. Um, it grew out of conversations that I had with Mike Livermore. Mike, where, where, where's Mike? Um, okay, well, uh, so M Mike was a student of mine, uh, and we wrote a book called Retaking Rationality, uh, How Cost-Benefit Analysis Can Better Protect the Environment and Our Health. And it was that book that uh, ultimately led to the founding of Policy Integrity. Um, it was a crazy thing for me to do because I was, I was the dean of the law school then. I was like really busy. But I figured there was such a compelling need for this kind of work that we should just go ahead and do it. And Mike was our executive director for five years uh, before he joined the Virginia faculty. Um, the reason I actually became interested in these issues goes back to the 1990s when I was um, on the EPA Science Advisory Board and served on the Environmental um, Economics Advisory Committee. Weirdly, they put me on it, even though I was like the only person on it that didn't have a PhD in economics. And, um, and we did uh, actually a really important document that in retrospect has been, has had a lot of staying power, which was we did a peer review for uh, EPA's first guidelines on the preparation of cost benefit analyses. You know, so among other things those guidelines brought you is the value of statistical life. It was when we did it, it was 5.9 million, 1997 dollars adjusted for inflation. It's between nine and $10 million now. That number has had a lot of staying power and has been adopted uh, across the federal government. But what was interesting about this process was that, you know, these meetings take place under the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Uh, interest groups representing polluters were there all the time to make their presentations with you know, fancy and very um, sophisticated Washington law firms representing them. At that time, no environmental organization ever showed up to talk to us. Um, and, um, and so why was that? Well, I think part of it was, well, they didn't trust cost benefit analysis, they didn't know how to deal with it, they hadn't built expertise in that area, and these were very important decisions that were, that were happening. And a, couple, a few years later, I was, talking about a book at some program at the American Enterprise Institute that said something about this, and a hand went up in the back of the audience, and it was Sally Katzen, uh, who uh, said, oh, when I was OIRA administrator in the Clinton administration, I had actually had a similar experience. Um, industry groups would have been happy to come talking about methodological issues around cost-benefit analysis, but progressive groups never showed up. Um, and our thought was, um, this balance has to be write it. Um, and that's what the book was about. I mean, the book basically looked at sort of eight fallacies that had emerged because essentially the business of cost-benefit analysis and of economic analysis of regulation had been essentially captured by anti-regulatory academics and by um, uh, trade associations for uh, the regulated community. And it's not that they were doing anything wrong. They were promoting their interests, but there were other interests that also were relevant that were just not at the table. And when policy integrity was funded, our goal was to basically produce scholarship in this area, uh, was to participate directly in regulatory proceedings, um, to basically um, try to explain uh, how cost-benefit analysis done properly could actually support um, um, rational environmental uh, protections and health and safety protections, and also to try to create a community of people in the NGO community that did this and create some capacity building around that. And I would say that 10 years later, you know, we feel very good about 
how this conversation has changed. And every major environmental NGO has lots of expertise in this area, participates regularly in these proceedings. Uh, the states uh, do it in their litigation. It's just a very different community around these issues. To give you an example of some of the things we actually feel really good about uh, that we did. So for example, in 2016, we did an amicus brief in the Seventh Circuit supporting uh, an Obama administration energy efficiency rule. And part of the benefit of this rule was a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. And for various reasons, the government had not um, defended its use of the social cost of carbon uh, in a particularly um, robust way. It was sort of like an issue that was kind of lost in, uh, in the middle of a paragraph in some brief. And we devoted our whole amicus brief to that. And the Seventh Circuit devoted seven pages of his opinion to say that the estimate of the social cost of carbon that came out of this interagency working group was a reasonable approach. And that was, came right out of our, of our brief. And it was, it, was, it was very important because it was the first time that a court of appeals ruled on the legality of this very important number. Um, we had similar success stories in a number of federal court cases, other, in other courts. Arguments in our briefs have been uh, prominently discussed in both arguments and opinions in Supreme Court cases on, on important uh, environmental um, uh, opinions. Um, we, we are also, we've also in recent years had, had a real success in shaping um, energy policy in the states. Um, our input helped change the way that the New York State Public Service Commission evaluates resiliency investments. Uh, the PSC also highlighted our comments in its decision to use the social cost of carbon uh, when calculating payments in its zero emission credit program, which was actually upheld uh, by the Second Circuit yesterday. We were involved in that case as an amicus party as well. I think the fact that the subsidy was tied to the social cost of carbon and not uh, determined in some uh, other way was important uh, to the Second Circuit in upholding the program. Um, we're very involved in efforts in a number of states to try to internalize um, the environmental and greenhouse gas consequences of energy production. Um, we participate in critical energy proceedings beyond New York State. Last year we pushed for policy improvements in California, Colorado, Nevada, New Jersey, Vermont, and, and, and other states. Um, uh, our research and analysis helped guide, helped guide federal natural resources leasing. Um, in 2016, the Interior Department launched a new effort to reform the coal leasing program uh, that relied uh, significantly on economic analysis that had been done uh, at Policy Integrity. Um, our scholarship and advocacy uh, led the Interior Department to account for the option value of delay in its analysis of offshore leasing. This was actually a lawsuit we brought um, against the Obama administration for its failure to consider the option values, and, the, and, and we won this case uh, in the D.C. Circuit, uh, and it became then something that the Interior Department actually takes into account. Um, part of our contributions are in the, um, in, in the academic area. So for example, on the social cost of carbon, uh, a number of us at Policy Integrity uh, published a number of articles, including a couple that we uh, co-authored with Ken Arrow, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, providing sort of the analytical uh, support for the use of these kinds of measures. And so looking back on 10 years, um, you know, we, we feel that now there is a robust attention and discussion of these issues um, among communities that actually want to have a strong and rational uh, regulations in the environmental health and safety area. I mean, interestingly, um, sometimes it's the other side that's kind of running away from these issues. Um, and, um, and it's also these issues that have been the hook for, um, I think, quite misguided uh, approaches of the current administration trying to suspend, stay, or delay um, existing regulations. Um, you know, that effort, the sort of suspension, stay, and delay effort has mostly failed in the courts over the last year and a half and has mostly failed because of the lack of proper attention to the rationality of the rule, sort of the economic consequences, the cost-benefit analysis, 
uh, the analysis and the regulatory impact uh, statements. So uh, it shows the power of the methodologies and why it's something that sort of the whole community, not just half the community, should be, should be interested in. So without further ado, I want to um, get our first panel started. Basically, I know I took a little long, but I was just a filler to get people to sit down and, uh, and get our speakers ready to, um, uh, to do their first panel. So our first panel is on advancing energy policy. Um, it will be um, moderated by my colleague, uh, Birchin Yunel, who is the, uh, our energy policy director. We have an extraordinarily um, uh, distinguished panel, uh, which I would love to introduce, but this is Birchin's job. And so I will ask Birchin and the panelists to come up so Birchin can introduce them and we can get started. Uh, thank you so much. So throughout the day, if you need anything, reach out to me or my, any of my Policy Integrity colleagues. We're really delighted that you're here. Well, thank you, Ricky, for the introduction. Where did he go? Um, oh, sorry. Thank you, Ricky, for the uh, introduction. I'm uh, delighted to be here, and thank you all for coming. Um, the, the, as Ricky mentioned, Policy Integrity does a lot of work, and participate in, we participate in uh, proceedings both in front of uh, FERC and uh, public service commissions and, and variety, variety of states. So I'm very excited to be talking about energy policy. Um, as you all know, the title of our conference is uh, en Energy and Environmental Policy, The Quest for Rationality. So in this first panel, we're going to be talking about how different jurisdictions and regulatory roles advance energy policy using uh, rational decision making. We have a fabulous panel, and I'm very excited about, uh, about their panel. They represent different roles and the kind of different jurisdictions and different uh, authorities. So I am very happy to hear what they have to say. I will not go through each of their uh, bios. We all know that they're very accomplished uh, people, but I'm very excited to be introducing you. First, Cheryl LaFleur, a commissioner at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, then I have Kathleen Frangioni, who is the chief policy advisor to, at the office of the governor of New Jersey. And last but not least, we have Andrew Place, who is the vice chairman of uh, Pennsylvania Public Utility Service Commission. Um, so thank you all for coming, and I'm very excited about this panel. Before starting with the panel, a few housekeeping uh, items. Each panelist is going to talk about the 15 minutes, and then we're going to have 30 minutes of discussion, questions, and answers. I'm going to take questions from the audience, but you have to write it down and pass it around to our policy associates and uh, students uh, walking around. Uh, I will compile them and ask as many of them as, as possible. And the second important announcement that I have to make is about ex parte communication rules. There are a few open dockets in front of FERC, so we cannot get into specific discussions about some of the issues. I know some of us would love to talk about MOPERS and FRRs and various you know, acronyms in the FERC space, but uh, if we do that, Commissioner Fleur will have to leave, and you know, that beats the purpose of uh, us having her here. Um, so uh, with that, uh, we're going to start from the federal level and move to the sta uh, states. So I would like to invite Commissioner LaFleur. Well, thank you very much, Burson. And thank you, Burson and Ricky and everyone here for all the work you do at FERC and in this area. We need all the help we can get to be rational. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, uh, I know you didn't go over my whole bio, but I just want to pull out one aspect of my bio is that I am a mother-in-law of a proud graduate of the NYU School of Law. <laughs> I've never been on campus. I lived in an NYU law dorm in 1977 when he wasn't born yet, but i um, very happy to be here today. Um, okay, first get the legal stuff out of the way. I speak only for myself, not for any other commissioner or the commission. And as Burson said, I can talk about rulemakings, broad 
policy judgments we're making, but I can talk about specific adjudicated open dockets among parties, particularly the, some of the market disputes that are going on right now in some of the regional markets like PJM. So I'll try to work around that. I've been at FERC eight years. We are a bipartisan commission, an independent agency like the SEC, the FCC, and others. We're bipartisan by design. So um, I've been in my second term. I was there for six years as part of a Democratic administration. I was there for a, an unprecedented eight-month stretch of having no quorum. Um, for a while, I was the only commissioner. Then we restocked, and now for the last however long it's been, I mean, Brian Williams says it every night, year and a half, or whatever it is, I have been a minority Democratic commissioner as part of the um, a Republican administration. Although right now we are short-staffed again. We are um, two Republican commissioners, including the chairman, and two Democratic and awaiting nominations. During the entire span of the time I've been at FERC, a great deal of our work in all areas of our work has really been driven by profound changes that are going on in the nation in how we use, transmit, and make energy. Um, driven by the growth of domestic natural gas, the growth of renewables, storage, demand side technologies, and increasing recognition of environmental issues, especially climate change. Um, these are, these Drivers are leading to a lot of new resources, and those resources are different in their cost patterns, in their operational um, patterns, and in their geography than the ones we use for most of the 20th century, and that's just driving a lot of change and turmoil. Those adaptations are being felt in different ways in different parts of the country, because different parts of the United States have different underlying regulatory structures, but the technology is changing everywhere and just being felt in different ways. What's happening is that these decisions, as we try to wend our way through the technology and policy changes, are being made, like everything in the United States, in the context of a very complicated political and constitutional ecosystem, with some stuff done at the federal level, a lot done in 50 state houses at the state level, some things done by environmental regulators, other things done by economic regulators, such as FERC, uh, but there's not neat um, divisions that you can drive between them so all of these worlds overlap. It would be much easier, although not necessarily preferable in my view, to be like China and somebody says, we shall change to this, and they change. That's not how the United States work. Change happens in fits and starts and is debated in a lot of places at once. At FERC, we're primarily an economic regulator, but our work is strongly shaped by environmental choices that are being made at the federal and state level. I would note most of this panel, because of Burson's expertise in this area, is going to be more in the market and um, resource choice issues, but we are an environmental regulator for one piece of our work that NYU and this institute have been very involved in, which is our infrastructure work. When we are issuing permits to gas pipelines and liquefied natural gas facilities, we're the lead agency under the National Environmental Policy Act, so we do the environmental review. And right now, sorry, uh, there's been quite a lot of debate, um, very heated and right in the moment, on how we take into account, if and how we take into account um, indirect climate impacts of gas infrastructure in our permitting decision making. And I'm happy to go there if that's where people want to go in the questions. I know that's not what this panel is about. But in that case, we're economic and environmental because we're doing the NEPA work. So yet another complexity. On all of the issues before us, our job is to apply the, st we're a creature of statute, apply the laws that govern us. Some of them are quite elderly, the Federal Power Act and the Natural Gas Act, um, but have been overlaid with years of precedential interpretation in the courts and at the commission. Apply those laws to the factual record before us. There's often a policy through line in our work but we have to start with the law and the record. That's kind of our defining um, ethos. A big issue that we've been confronting for the last couple of years, and we have the states before us that are um, in many ways at the center of that, is uh, how to reconcile 
the wholesale interstate regional market structures in the United States with individual states making different direct governmental selection of energy resources for policy reasons. This is especially acute in states like Pennsylvania and many of the other Middle Atlantic states and, and the New England states and New York where they deregulated the underlying generation and, um, and New Jersey didn't have quite the same deregulation, but that where they deregulated the underlying um, generation went to a market structure to get new generation built, and now um, they've been operating in these big regional <coughs> compacts and have states choosing specific resources. Um, wholesale markets were set up about 20 years ago. After all the nuclear debates of the 70s and the 80s and the overruns, the thought was we'll put these markets together, we'll use economics to choose resources. And in my opinion, having lived through all stages of it, they have worked very, very well for customers, but they have done what they were designed to do, which is continually find the cheapest resources to keep the lights on at any particular moment to get reliability at least cost. That's what markets are designed to do. In recent years, um, with all the, the resource changes that I've mentioned, particularly the growth of very cheap natural gas generation and zero marginal cost wind and solar, has brought energy prices down in the markets sharply, which, at least in some respects, is very good for customers. But they've roiled the market because they've created winners and losers, as markets do, and led to multiple efforts and concerns on behalf of the resources that are not thriving in the market. And I'll just give a few examples. At the federal level, in the Energy Department at the White House, the Trump administration has been open about its desire to ensure the success to subsidize older, uneconomic, baseload coal units that are challenged in the market and would otherwise retire. Um, other baseload generation as well, but a lot of the heat has been around coal. In the states, in several of the states, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Connecticut, have been looking to subsidize uneconomic nuclear units for various state policy reasons, both clean energy and jobs in many cases, most often through requiring um, distribution level electric customers to pay resource specific credit to those units. Many other states, including some of the same ones, but I'll call out Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey, are running very large procurements for designated resource, particularly offshore wind, um, on strict timelines to meet various clean energy goals and seeking forward assurances that those resources will be accepted in the market or they won't have to buy um, duplicate resources. Since 2016, with the abdication of federal uh, actions on climate, the state actions have only accelerated, and I expect that trend to continue at least for the next few years. We're seeing more and more of the action at the state level, and that's causing more of this rub between the regional structures and the states. So those people who invested in resources in reliance in the, on the wholesale market structures without any state support particularly gas generators that built into the market largely to replace coal over the last decade, have used a number of judicial and administrative litigation efforts to try to defeat or um, affect or change the impact of the state policies to choose other resources. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I mean, I, this, is, this is like late breaking news all the time, but a couple of weeks ago, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that state programs to pay nuclear units carbon credits are not preempted by FERC's authority over wholesale markets. And yesterday, the Second Circuit agreed, in a longer opinion, um, said pretty much the same thing as the Seventh Circuit, that those programs are not preempted. In part, they said they were not preempted. There was no conflict preemption because they said that FERC already has the authority under the Federal Power Act to require market changes if market changes are required to protect the integrity of the market price. Um, that is what the U.S. on behalf of FERC had argued in the amicus brief at the Seventh Circuit that we had the market authority already so there was no preemption. So it calls to mind the Confucian um, saying of beware of what you want you may get it. So now these cases are squarely at FERC to um, figure out what's been in litigation for a couple years. 
My personal goal has been to adapt the markets to meet state objectives while still attaining market um, benefits for customers. I think the markets have done a good job for customers. I think if we're going to get rid of them, we should do so in a very deliberate and thoughtful way with everyone involved. I'm concerned about unplanned re-regulation if we just kind of chip away at them everywhere. I would far rather have a thoughtful market design solution at a regional level, and that's what I've been pushing. So the different regions have come up with different plans. Um, in New York, not so far from here, well, actually, we are in New York. I'm looking at <laughs> Kathleen and think I'm in New Jersey. In New York, where we stand. Um, <laughs> They have chosen the Economist Plan A, direct carbon pricing in the energy market. Um, they haven't done it yet, but they're on a path to do it. And this is in addition to the regional greenhouse gas pricing, which is much lower. This would be um, social cost of carbon derived in some way, carbon pricing in the energy market that they're talking about. It is the most market compatible way to set a clean energy or a carbon tar target and then use markets to meet it, to make sure you meet it in the most efficient way. And it would kind of, you could still run the market because it's already monetized um, by the whatever carbon price you use. And they are working toward that, you know, and at some point we'll be filing presumably a new market structure, undoubtedly not unanimous for us to consider. But, um, economically, whether it's going to be the right policy decision depends on a lot of things, but it is what economists have been calling for, use a monetizable value to achieve clean energy goals. Up in New England, where I'm from, um, they've been dealing primarily with the issue of forward procurement of big um, swaths of clean energy that was not selected by and would probably not be selected economically in the market, particularly Canadian hydro and offshore wind. And there, the market up there, the independent system operator of New England, came up with a plan to kind of run a second auction, a second market auction. After you choose resources, then you do a forward procurement and you can replace some of the others. It's an attempt to use market structures to choose the best of the clean resources without um, affecting the pricing of the people who aren't subsidized in the market. Um, it was approved by FERC in June on a very controversial split vote. I voted for it. The three people who voted for it are at the moment still at FERC, but it's pending rehearing. I think that's right. Yes, the three people who voted for it are still at FERC. Um, but that um, is pending rehearing and is, has a lot of controversy around it. Most controversial of all down in PJM which used to stand for Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland, if you want to know where it is, but now it has 13 states. Um, they have been dealing, they have forward procurements too, but a lot of the energy has been around the payments to subsidize nuclear units for their carbon-free properties. And um, after spending a couple years trying to come up with a market redesign proposal that would accommodate those efforts, PJM was unable to do so, filed two proposals at FERC and say, here's two ideas, take a look at these, see what you think. Um, FERC rejected both of them and came up with its own, which was basically an approach to take subsidized resources out of the market entirely and kind of subdivide, subdivide the market. Um, both of the Republicans who were on the commission, wait a minute, both of the Republicans who were still on the commission voted for it. Both of the Democrats who were still on the commission voted against it. I voted against it. And um, it is now pending. The filing is due next week, and that is sure to be a very, very hot topic at FERC this winter. Um, as far as uh, the federal efforts, uh, last fall, FERC made a rare appearance out of our energy press into the world press when uh, Secretary Perry proposed a rulemaking. There's used some part of the Federal Power Act that's almost never used to propose for us to directly order subsidization of the baseload units if they had 90 days of fuel on site. And um, after a lot of sturm and drung, in January, FERC, I'm happy to say, unanimously rejected that. And, but we started our own docket and said, we're gonna look at this ourselves and see if there's anything we should be doing on behalf of those units that have um, resilient qualities as the administration had asserted 
they were worried about. That is still pending. We have gotten thousands upon thousands of comments from everyone on all ends of the spectrum, and it is pending before us. In the meantime, the administration has talked about using emergency provisions of either the Federal Power Act or the Defense Production Act to still pay the coal units directly. Um, there have been so many rumors that that is imminent that I no longer know, I mean, whether I believe rumors at all is a tough question, but those have just been coming and coming. I'm assuming eventually something will drop, some shoe will drop, but in the end it will come to FERC to undoubtedly um, deal with complaints about what that does in the market, but we shall see what happens. Um, but this will all continue. The resource changes aren't going anywhere. The climate is still expected to be done at the state level for the next couple years. So we will be using our complicated constitutional federal system to pound through these changes. And it's going to be a lot of fun for everyone. So th <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm, as an economist myself, I certainly cannot stop smiling when somebody mentions carbon pricing, so I'm very excited. Okay. Next up, we have Kathleen Pangioni, who is the Chief Policy Advisor uh, to the Office of the Governor for the State of New Jersey. Thank you so much. Um, Cheryl, it's amazing how exciting energy markets can be. I mean, this is, um, it's a pretty wild time. <laughs> um, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm not an attorney, so I know I'm in a, a minority in the room, but um, hopefully you'll all um, treat me gently and we'll still um, have, I'll be able to give you all a really good sense of the exciting things happening in New Jersey in this space. Um, a little bit of my background, uh, I am, uh, I grew up in New Jersey, but spent uh, most of my career working at the federal level. Um, mostly on Capitol Hill and then in and around Capitol Hill um, in a quest for rationality, uh, like this conference, um, decided to try to uh, do my work in a different space uh, for a few years, which has taken me back to my home state of New Jersey. Um, I have been lucky enough to um, to work with uh, with Governor Murphy as his chief policy advisor, luckier even um, for this month, uh, I've I've stepped into the shoes of um, our acting commissioner uh, at the Department of Environmental Protection. While well, she's uh, many of you probably um, know her, Catherine McCabe. Looking at David, I'm sure um, a lot of folks in the room who have spent time in D.C. know her from her time at Federal EPA. Um, she had to. Uh, uh, take a month's absence uh, to deal with some family issues. So I'm lucky enough to speak to you today, not only from the vantage point of Governor Murphy's um, policy office, but also with a little bit of um, expertise imbued from our um, excellent colleagues at DEP. So um, hopefully that will all serve um, useful for our conversation today. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are following developments just to our south, so I thought I'd run through um, kind of uh, the highlights, as it were, of um, what we've been up to um, since Governor Murphy took office in January. Um, so New Jersey and Virginia both have uh, uh, gubernatorial election cycles that are off from the rest of um, of the election cycle uh, nationally. So uh, Governor Murphy was elected in November, um, inaugurated in January, and we've really been off to the races ever since. Um, during his campaign, um, climate change was really um, a top priority, a theme um, that the now governor uh, came back to repeatedly, really permeated um, many discussions during the campaign. Um, and within, I think it was probably the first two weeks of the administration, um, he signed an executive order uh, directing the DEP uh, to begin to work to rejoin uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI, um, and also uh, implement regs um, at the state level to, uh, to fa facilitate that entry. Um, and so uh, our DEP has been in active negotiations with the other Reggie Reg states to determine the, um, the terms of our re-entry. I say re-entry, uh, we were an original member of Reggie. Prior Governor Christie pulled us out and now we are going through the motions of, of getting back in, um, which we're, we're really looking forward to um, rejoining our sister states in taking that leadership role um, nationally in terms of um, carbon emission reductions. Um, 
We also joined the, um, actually di were directed by our legislature to join the U.S. Climate Alliance, um, which is, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar, but a really um, impressive and exciting group of states um, here in the U.S. who have kind of taken on the mantle and, and carrying forward the commitments of the Paris Agreement um, in light of the Trump administration um, pulling out. Um, uh, we're also uh, starting to tackle uh, more on the resilience and adaptation side of the um, of the climate equation. Obviously, um, New Jersey and, and New York's experience with uh, Superstorm Sandy has afforded us a unfortunate amount of experience um, in addressing a lot of coastal resilience issues. There's a lot of expertise in our state, um, particularly in a lot of our municipalities. Um, so we're looking forward to pulling all of that together. Um, and the DEP will actually be hosting a coastal resilience summit um, in early October. Um, and we'd really um, welcome any of you that have a particular interest in, in um, that side uh, of the conversation to, to join us for that. I believe it's the 8th and 9th. Um, and uh, I guess I'd just say broadly that, um, and then I'll talk more about energy policy, but, but um, climate really is a, you know, when I think about the, the themes of this conference, climate really is a um, kind of a decision-making lens for us um, in New Jersey. Um, and we're trying to be very thoughtful of how we make any number of decisions um, to really um, consider uh, our, our impact on climate change um, and our ability to mitigate climate impacts. And it really does imbue our decision making. It's not to say it's, it's always going to be the only consideration. Obviously, there are a number, number of other um, top priorities that we're focused on. I'd say, you know, prime among them really is um, kind of what, what we like to to call uh, inclusive economic growth. Um, New Jersey, uh, unfortunately, has not really um, benefited from the growth the country has seen uh, writ large over the last, um, really since since the recession. Um, and we're, we're working very hard um, with so many, particularly of our urban communities, um, to try to reverse that trend and, and get ourselves back uh, where we need to be and back on track uh, with a lot of other states in the region and, and nationally um, post-economic um, recession. So that is, uh, and the governor is going to be giving a big economic speech on Monday, so be sure to tune in. Um, but that, of course, is a consistent um, focus for us. Um, and uh, kind of more related to um, energy policy, of course, New Jersey is a high cost state. We all know that. And so consistent focus on um, affordability um, for our consumers um, is another thing that drives us. Um, also, uh, environmental justice is an issue that um, the governor is very committed to, spoke out um, consistently on the campaign and since he's been in office about prioritizing environmental justice, especially given the number of um, urban centers in New Jersey. So that's another area I'd just like to highlight. Um, and we really see, um, you know, I think so many, our, our best tool for uh, addressing uh, climate change in the state um, is making a significant shift in our sources and patterns of energy use. Um, and during the campaign, Governor Murphy made um, a bold commitment to putting the state on a path to 100% clean energy by 2050. Um, and so we have been um, racing to try to put that in motion. Um, let's see, let me walk through a few things with you and keep me on time because there's a, oh, there's a lot I could talk about. Um, but I think the, the way that we're really thinking about this, the framework for us is our energy master planning process. I know a lot of states have um, uh, kind of uh, structures like this. For us, it's a um, it's written in statute. Every three years, uh, the governor is supposed to direct uh, an energy master plan to take place. Usually it doesn't happen every three years. Typically, it'll happen at the beginning of an administration. Um, during the Christie administration, they did too. Um, and so uh, this is the opportunity for us to really take a step back broadly, um, look at the energy picture in the state, um, and kind of set out, um, our, um, you know, set out our path forward. It's intended to be, a, I think, a 10-year um, look forward document. Um, and so uh, we're taking a pretty broad look. Um, you know, we're thinking about infrastructure, technology, uh, grid modernization. Um, we're bringing the transportation sector into the conversation, which hasn't always happened uh, in the EMP process in New Jersey, um, doing a lot of thinking about um, electric vehicles, electrification writ large. Um, having a lot of conversations with um, other uh, sister states through the, um, the TCI process, um, which I think New York is involved in as well. Um, we have a number of themes for that. Uh, 
uh, EMP process. One is putting New Jersey on a path to achieving 100% clean energy by 2050. One is growing our clean energy economy. One is ensuring reliability and affordability for all our customers, uh, reducing the state's carbon footprint, and advancing new technologies for all New Jersey residents. Um, that's, the, that's the frame for our effort. We're in the middle of a um, extensive uh, kind of public engagement and public comment process, which all of you would be welcome to join us for. I think there's a few more weeks left uh, for comments. Um, we're really looking to get kind of the best thinking and the best input from all corners. Um, so um, I don't know, Barson, if, uh, if you all are tracking this, but we'd love to get we some are. insights. Um, terrific. Are. Terrific. Um, but it's, a, it's an exciting opportunity for us to really um, take a hard look at, you know, kind of all of the big energy questions that we're discussing here today and try to set ourselves on a path forward. Um, and we really do hope it'll be um, an exciting stakeholder process, if such a thing exists, and um, that we'll really get a lot of uh, good input and have a good product that'll rationalize a lot of um, decision making uh, in the state. Um, so that's, uh, that's one major activity that we're moving forward on right now. Um, the second thing to talk about, and Cheryl mentioned this, um, is offshore wind. Um, New Jersey is, uh, I mean, we know that Massachusetts is doing a lot, and obviously New York is doing a lot, but we really see ourselves um, as, uh, you know, we hope to be in that um, leadership list of offshore wind states for the country. Um, we do have, we're kind of on um, strong footing statutorily, which is, which is helpful. Um, our Offshore Wind Economic Development Act was passed um, back in 2010 at the beginning of the Christie administration, and then basically nothing happened for eight years. So um, the good news, I mean, it's bad because there was no progress. The good news for us is that we do have a fairly firm statutory footing to work from, so we're able to move um, fairly quickly, uh, which um, has really worked to our benefit. Uh, about the same time the governor signed his Reggie executive order, he also signed one on offshore wind, uh, directing our Board of Public Utilities to move forward with every uh, authority that they have as swiftly as they can to put us on uh, a track to meet the 3,500 uh, megawatt goal that the governor had set out during the campaign. So. We know that's a lot. Um, BPU started working on an offshore wind strategic plan. Uh, they issued uh, proposed OREC rules in July, I believe. Just last week, BPU put out the biggest solicitation in the nation for 1,100 megawatts of wind. Um, and the governor also directed BPU to put out uh, 1,200 megawatt solicitations in 2020 and 2022, which would get us to our 3,500 megawatt goal. So we are off and running. Um, and I think yesterday, if not today, our um, Economic Development Authority is also um, releasing a request for information to get some more um, good, smart insight externally on um, uh, port infrastructure and what the needs um, for that will be with the um, supply chain that we're hoping uh, will come to New Jersey. So um, there's a lot happening. I'm happy to speak more to the solicitation um, if folks are interested in learning more about that. Um, we can do that during the Q&A. One thing just to note, again, to our rationality conversation is that one one thing that's a little bit different about New Jersey's um, uh, requirements than you've seen in Massachusetts and some other places is that we do um, have a very robust net economic benefits test built in as part of our um, uh, determination process on these offshore wind solicitations. Um, the solicitations will need to include both an environmental protection plan as well as an economic development plan. Um, so that's um, a notable just difference from the way that some other states are pursuing theirs. Um, and um, the other uh, was kind of a sister uh, companion bill to that, which again Cheryl touched on, um, is our ZEC program, um, which, was, uh, which was also established at that time. Um, and uh, happy to take questions on that as well. Uh, we obviously, we get 40% of our power from um, our nuclear units, um, and we see that as a critical component of our um, climate change strategy um, and an essential feature of um, kind of moving forward on our clean energy agenda. Um, the board is going through uh, its process right now. Um, they'll be determining the need to issue these ZECs um, and uh, which in turn would be, as Cheryl described, purchased by our um, 
our state's utilities. And there's a number of public meetings coming up. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just inviting you all to New Jersey consistently. I'm, I'm kind of hearing myself, uh, but you really are welcome. Um, and we'll be looking for input and feedback from stakeholders on the ZEC program. Um, uh, the, what the application process should look like and how we'll, we'll uh, rank um, the applications, um, assuming that um, any of them uh, would be eligible to receive the ZAC. Um, so I think those are the major um, processes we're going through right now. One thing, um, and I promise I'm not gonna result in Cheryl having to run off the stage, but I would be remiss if I didn't highlight um, a few items that we're uh, very focused on and, and concerned about that we do um, think uh, may have the potential to derail some of our um, climate and clean energy goals. We're tracking very closely um, and engaging actively in. Um, one is uh, the capacity market reform proposals that Cheryl talked about. Um, uh, you know, active conversation obviously at, um, at FERC and at PJM. Um, we're very concerned about how those proposals might thwart states like New Jersey um, from carrying out their climate agendas and are, um, like I said, actively participating in those processes. Um, we also have a lot of concerns about current conversations uh, regarding transmission cost allocation um, and the impact of those decisions um, on electricity prices for New Jersey households. Um, so those are two I would flag. I was very happy to hear um, Cheryl speak to how um, she is urging those processes to be um, very deliberate and thoughtful. I think we feel the same way. We're concerned that um, particularly on the capacity market side, some of this is going very quickly um, and we want to make Make sure that um, there's a, you know, it is a deliberate process, and that there's a real opportunity for um, states um, to be active participants in um, in working through how these issues will be resolved. So, um, thank you for having me. Look forward to the conversation. Um, it's fun to be here. And last but not least, Andrew Place, who's the vice chairman of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission. Thank you very much. Certainly a pleasure to be here. Uh, where to begin? Um, I will, since this is a CLE uh, credit, I'll try to bore you to tears. Um, and, uh, I have a host of things. 50 minutes is tight. Any, I have seven issues I was going to plan on bringing up. Any one of them could be a day-long symposium. Um, some big things, some minutia, some just uh, venting my spleen, if I can quote Herman Melville. The, uh, Pennsylvania, in comparison to New Jersey, where you are today, um, and many of our neighboring states. Uh, close, close enough. I can hit it with a stone from here. <laughs> yes, um, we're going to get uh, pulled from the stage. The um, uh, Pennsylvania is a tough political environment. I won't sugarcoat it. I may as well get that up, up front. Um, but that said, there's a gubernatorial election coming up in five or six weeks. Um, Pennsylvania, by the numbers, uh, I think speaks to the complexity of our issues. Um, uh, we are a restructured state. Um, we have competitive retail market for uh, electricity, natural gas. The, uh, we're the largest net electricity exporter in the U.S. I'll put that in context, uh, we export about 30% 30, 30 of our electricity generation. So exports to our neighbors, um, whether it's to our south, Maryland and New Jersey and New England, New York, um, that matters to our industry. Um, we're also the third largest electricity producer, period, behind Texas and Florida. We're the second uh, state um, for energy production. So everything from coal, natural gas, uh, et cetera. Um, we're also second in the nation for natural gas production behind Texas. Uh, it's often referred to as the proverbial Saudi Arabia, um, our shale gas production. So um, that, that is a 400 pound gorilla. Um, we're also second in the nation for nuclear production. We have 26 gigawatts of uh, capa uh, nuclear capacity. So again, a big deal for us. Um, we're third, again, all right, another thing to hit our uh, complexity, we're third in the country for coal production. Um, which also brings us down to the bottom line. We're third in the country for CO2 production, and that's just stack emissions. Um, I always bring forth that uh, we have to think about, particularly when we're thinking of natural gas, um, methane emissions, since it's a particularly potent greenhouse gas, uh, that we cannot neglect upstream emissions there, and I'll speak to that briefly as well. 
Um, giving you the breakdown um, on our generation, uh, we're pretty well balanced. Um, 30, almost 30 percent from natural gas, 25 uh, percent from coal, 40 uh, percent uh, generation from nuclear. Uh, we do have a um, renewable carve out. Uh, we're also speaking of PJM. We're about 20 percent of all the generation in PJM, even though it's 13 states in the District of Columbia. Um, again, it matters. The, um, uh, we have a modest, and maybe that's a kind way of saying it, um, alternative energy portfolio standard. Uh, uh, tier 1, 8% by 2020. Tier 2, which is a whole host of things, including waste coal in it, of 10% by 2020. But that's uh, consu consumption, that's not generation. Uh, so first and foremost, and these issues I did not rank in sort of any order. Um, there's no rationale for why I thought of these things and what, the way I did. But uh, um, again, think about natural gas and I'm also thinking about my background in a way. I'm in some ways the, um, an accidental commissioner. Um, I was working in upstream oil and gas. Um, I was a corporate director for energy and environmental policy at uh, arguably the largest independent in the Appalachian Basin, if not the nation. Um, and my task was to think about what risks are, cradle to grave, everything from wellheads to uh, uh, groundwater uh, risk to, um, so, to wells, to VOC emissions from condensate tanks, um, to what are ultimate, are we displacing coal, what's the greenhouse gas, what's the 2030, 2040, 2050 horizon for greenhouse gas emissions um, from what we are producing and um, how that affects the market. Um, and I got a cold call from a 717 area code, um, Harrisburg, um, and asked if I would come and serve on the commission. I could barely have found Harrisburg on the map. Um, but um, as a friend of mine at graduate school said, I, was, I may not be very particularly smart, but I'm, I'm smart enough to know I shouldn't say no. Um, but that said, you know, when you think about it, it was, and as I stated in the Pennsylvania by the numbers, um, it's an extraordinarily important time, relevant and fascinating, intellectually fascinating moment to be in Pennsylvania in this space. I mean, it's a sort of n-dimensional point space on all the issues we have to, to bring forth uh, and consider. Um, it's not binary, it's not tertiary, it's, it's, it's almost infinite thinking about all the ways I have to think about and the PUC is a phenomenally fascinating place to think about all of these issues and I'll, I'll speak to them in parts in all these issues, the seven issues I have before us today. Um, but we do not currently have siding authority for pipelines. Um, that's a concern of mine. Uh, there is legislation to have some sort of siding authority, whether that exists within the PUC or some other created entity. Um, I think it makes rational sense to do that. Uh, we do it for high voltage aerial lines. Um, that goes back to the dawn of time uh, and probably for the 1930s. There were aesthetic reasons, perhaps safety reasons, that siding was um, thought to be important to have a regulatory oversight. Um, but when I mean, you think about that anal analog of high voltage lines, to me, I cannot avoid that there's a direct parallel to what we're doing in natural gas um, and natural gas liquids. Um, what a siting authority would bring is an adversarial process. So all the parties can come in and public comment. Uh, you can think about all the impacts instead of what we do currently. Um, if uh, an entity has a, a certificate to build a pipe, we just look at does it make economic rational sense? Is there a demand for the product they're going to move? And that's the end of the story. Um, that's not going to be, to me, sufficient when you're dealing with you're thinking about townships, uh, the impacts on communities, um, concerns about safety. The, uh, an adversarial process can bring before us multiple alternatives and we can balance all those end dimensions, the environmental impact, the, the health and safety impacts, the, um, the impacts on a township's 2030, 2040 um, build out plan. So um, all of that, the adversarial process that goes through to me can bring a lot of rationality to it that we don't currently have. Um, and in a sort of tertiary thing uh, issue as well, and we recently had um, uh, an explosion in Western Pennsylvania two weeks ago. The um, um, and I that's an active case before us, but and it's still uncertain what caused that. But I don't, if I if I can be blunt, um, I don't think the commission has enough safety oversight. We have safety authority, but it begins when you energize the pipe. 
Um, and uh, it makes much more rational sense to be in when you're building the pipe. Um, what's the geophysics? Uh, what's the ge geologic characteristics of, of where you're putting that pipe through? Um, should you consider an alternative? None of that, it, all of that is behind the curtain to us. And uh, com we're coming in in the 11th hour when much of this is already done. And we also don't have, arguably, the staff to, to do the amount of oversight that I think is required. Um, again, thinking in the, in the natural gas space, methane loss, as I mentioned earlier, matters. Um, uh, we have a very forward-leaning distribution system improvement charge, which allows immediate re cost recovery for utilities, which has brought down the length of time it takes for utilities to get all that legacy leaky pipe out of the ground uh, from virtually infinite or 100-year time horizons down to under 20 years and 10 and 15 years. Um, that really matters for public safety, but also for leakage. I mean, those are leaky pipes. They're expensive to get out of the ground. It's, um, it can be a million dollars a mile. But getting that out matters from a climate perspective. Um, we also have a, a rather unusual or forward-leaning um, program to ensure that we reduce leakage from our distribution pipes, again, a source of significant methane emissions. Um, uh, starting in 2013, our distribution companies not only had to have metrics for what their leakage was and know what their leakage is, but also bring it down from a maximum of 5% um, on a glide path to 3% next year. Um, that has been ex extraordinarily helpful for us, not only to know where those leaks are, but to have a risk-based analysis on when, how you're getting that pipe out, when you're getting that pipe out, what's the most at-risk pipe. Um, and has, has brought significant improvements on the leakage rate um, for our distribution companies. Um, the next effort on that, currently ongoing, is to take that same approach and apply it to gathering lines, uh, which again, legacy gathering lines are a significant source of methane leakage. The, um, I'm going to be cranking along here. Uh, I would be extremely neglectful if I didn't talk about low-income customers. Uh, Pennsylvania has, uh, we're 23rd in the nation for poverty, so we have a significant issue. We have 1.6 million residents living below the federal poverty line. I think it's something like 1.3 million households are living between, below one and a half times the federal poverty line. Um, so this matters. Um, and all these conversations um, about cost uh, always has this knock-on impact. What's it going to do to our vulnerable customers? Um, we are doing, we undertook, um, I did a motion uh, last year and we launched uh, energy burden analysis to say what is affordable. If you're b between zero and 50 percent of favorite poverty line, what percentage of your income can you contribute to energy, your monthly energy bills and keep your head above water? Um, that analysis is now in and I'm expecting next week to see a formal presentation on that and that's the first piece. And then we're going to take that, all that analysis and um, rebuild uh, what was done in 1992 and uh, said if you, these are the expectations for our utilities. If a person is 0 to 50 percent of the federal poverty line, they can afford X. Is it 6 percent? Is it 7 percent? Is it 3 percent of their income to be on energy and you cannot bill above that. Um, historically, that was a policy statement and was um, neglected more than it was obeyed. Um, and I expect uh, my push will be to make it a rule. Um, we're also doing, as uh, New Jersey is, um, uh, looking at community solar and using that to um, help offset uh, low income, do a chunk of that, a, a tranche of that for low income customers. Um, you know, and also this matters. Um, we have an energy efficiency standard. Uh, there's hope in the next administration we can make that more robust because uh, a lot of our low-income customers are the least able to manage their electricity bills and least able to aff um, afford, et cetera, et cetera, all the uh, things that those of us in the middle class, et cetera, can do. Um, a minor issue, but one that matters and speaks to me on the, speaks to the, the issue of cost. Um, we are not, as a commonwealth, uh, as a commission, careful enough in our empiricism and our transparency on, on return on equity calculations. Uh, we do quarterly return on equity uh, measures, uh, but they become precedential for rate case settlements. Uh, and th this is the return that our utilities get. Um, and we're high. Um, and I'm always a minority of one. 
um, on our commission on this issue, uh, so I don't have any expectation I'll win in my time, my tenure. But the, um, I, we're a regulatory friendly environment, but yet we're paying above market rates on our ROEs. Uh, and that, speaking back to my previous issue on low income customers, that feeds back to the challenges we have. And even though, as I noted, you know, we, we're producing a lot of energy, our utility bills are higher than many of our neighbors. And I, I think and this is one of the reasons why. Um, transmission projects have also been on our list. Um, the, um, historically, we do letters of notification and zero. None of those were ever uh, rejected. Um, uh, to me, that's salutary. Um, that's eye-catching, it makes my head spin. But the um, uh, last several months, my office in particular has been leading an effort to bring um, a need question to that and an alternatives question to that. Uh, we're seeing far too many transmission projects being built that may not be necessary and they end up being rate-based and again in the cost of energy. Um, and it, uh, we, need, we do as a commission, and there's a, we are clearly moving that direction, making much greater strides to being much more careful and judicious and um, empirical and rational in what gets built. Um, as Alfred Kahn said, which he was a professor of mine at Cornell back in the day, um, and I, I really regret that I was a freshman econ major, and I just thought it was, hey, just take this class. Um, I realized I should have paid more attention. But the um, uh, but if the utility, if you let a utility, they build a pyramid, a great base of your pyramid. So, not to take a shot of our utilities, but we do. I mean, that's our oversight role. Um, so finally, and are we two more? One more minute? Okay. Um, the big issue, um, the question about uh, accommodating state policies and climate and, and so on, and as been mentioned um, uh, by th two panelists before me, I mean, all the alternatives, thinking about how we manage um, this, this barrage, this incoming tide of state policies in, in energy or capacity markets, um, and all the rubrics, all the complexities uh, out there, the, you know, the FRR and the MOPRAX and so on. Um, the, it, it matters, and to me, I'm always coming back to I'd rather, and I'll argue tooth and nail in Pennsylvania for a market price on carbon, uh, for all the reasons we know, the elegance of it, um, uh, the, the drive for innovation. Um, but, uh, and I am always challenged when, and I'm no fan of Zex, um, but they're, all, you know, they're blunt instruments, and it, thinking again about the impacts and what our obligations are to manage and moderate the price of energy um, and the economic demand that we do that. Um, it's tough for me to think that any alternative other than a market solution um, is, is ra particularly rational, um, although they may be politically expedient or necessary. Uh, expedient, sorry, is probably not a good word. Um, but I uh, apologize for that. Um, but whether, um, as I said, we have an election coming up, whether Pennsylvania would join Reggie, we would double the size of Reggie if we joined. Um, be a big deal. Um, we would push a strong modeling to say that we would, uh, Pennsylvania joining Reggie would take the price up from, say, 4 or $5 to 7 or $8. Um, uh, rec. Um, uh, on the other hand, if we, if we had a market price, and even if we, if we put a price in, if it was a price in carbon that was twelve and a half, thirteen dollars uh, um, a megawatt hour, the um, or a ton of carbon emitted, the um, um, that would preserve our nuclear. Um, the six or eight dollar range at Reggie would likely not, um, and to me that's a, a challenge, a conundrum because the. Um, I see value in retaining Pennsylvania's nuclear fleet. Not all of it, perhaps. Three Mile Island is always going to be challenged. Um, but the uh, uh, temporally, um, from a cost expect, uh, expectation, keeping that nuclear generation matters. It's, it's operating today. It'll take us decades to replace 26 gigawatts of generation with anything else. Um, and um, I, I, I just caution that for no other reason, it's not a reason to choose a, a Reggie versus a price on carbon, but the, um, um, but I, that is in my mind that, hey, uh, okay, what is the, what is it, what price would, um, would retain uh, the nuclear generation um, in Pennsylvania? Um, and you know, again, speaking of Pennsylvania, flipping back to the, my earlier point about Pennsylvania is a challenged place to be, and um, yeah, be upfront, be honest, uh, clear that, 
the costs of climate aren't particularly borne by Pennsylvanians. Um, yeah, we have some coastline, well, um, uh, greater storms, greater intense storms. Um, we have more stream than any other you know, the 48 states, uh, lower 48, 49 states. Um, uh, nice math. The, um, uh, so there are clear impacts, but, um, but we are not the direct, um, the ones most hurt by, uh, by climate change. But that is not a reason not to act. I mean, that's a fundamentally lousy reason not to act. Um, I think about, I live on a farm, and this foothills of the Appalachians, uh, I raise sheep and cattle. Um, but I am a steward of my, my stream. I have a 55-acre riparian buffer uh, with five and a half thousand trees I planted around the stream. And I was thinking yesterday, it was pouring down rain, and the, stream, the water leaving my farm is clean. And my neighbor's receiving water that is an exceptional condition when it leaves my farm. And I don't do that because it's a regulatory necessity, and the, the obligation doesn't, doesn't begin with someone giving me an edict to do something. It, it begins with my moral obligation, my ethical obligation to me, to be a steward of that resource. Um, and that goes no differently for Pennsylvania, even though as I started this conversation, um, we've got a whole host of challenges to, um, that make this a, a very difficult environment to do something with. But and with that, we'll move on. Thank you to all of our panelists. As a reminder, we have people around walking uh, with index cards. If you want to ask questions, just write them on an index card and they will come to me. While you work on that, I'm going to start um, with a couple questions myself as um, using moderator's privilege. So I want to kind of um, uh, pass this maybe slightly irrational times that we're, we're living and I want to look forward and kind of think about the future of regulation. I think about you know, where the electricity regulation is going all the time. Um, many of you mentioned there are you know, a lot of uh, transformation happening in the grid. We have clean energy policies, states are taking aggressive action because federal government is not taking it, uh, any action. So we have ag aggressive state policies driving you know, more renewables onto the grid. The grid needs to accommodate that. The grid itself you know, infrastructurally has to change. You know, trans transmission lines, you know, all, the, all the technology has to change. At the same time, market rules have to change. You know, we have to think about how to price and you know, when we have most of the resources, you know, marginal cost zero, like how does the price formation? So all these things uh, need to change, mostly driven by state policies. At the same time, the second driver is we have uh, an immense change in technology. We have distributed energy resources. We have these technologies that we didn't think was possible, you know, several years back. You can put a solar panel and an energy storage in your house behind your meter, some aggregator can you know, pull your resources, your neighbor resources together and bid that into the wholesale market. Um, so it, this idea of you know, bright line jurisdiction between uh, federal and state, if ever existed, it is becoming blurrier, uh, blurrier and blurrier and trying to you know, figure that you know, where does this stop uh, is, is becoming difficult. So I want to ask your opinions about where do you see the future of electricity regulation <laughs> going on within this, you know, federalism framework? How do we, you know, how do you think the uh, energy policy making and the electricity regulation is going to evolve? The, the paradigm is evolving for sure, but you know, where, where do you th think we're gonna end up in 10 years? Sure. Well, you, you posited two change drivers, concern about climate and new technologies. We'll take those as given at a hopefully accelerating rate. I would say we're seeing two conflicting forces that are in tension. One is, to some extent, the new technologies and the concern about climate are forcing more regionalization because clean energy technology is not equally 
available all over the United States. There are places where it's much better to put the wind in large scale central station solar. So we're seeing, for example, in the Western United States for the first time, considerable market sharing of resources across very diverse states, very far apart population centers. And that trend is pushing toward more regionalization in order to get clean. And we may see more of that in the, in the east when we start seeing more of the development of offshore wind as well, that sharing. And I think that requires a federal role, probably an expanded federal role in transmission siting from what we have now if we're really going to decarbonize the way renewable, the renewable Energy Lab and others have talked about. Um, you almost need like Abraham Lincoln and the railroads and Eisenhower and the highways to build a little bit more of a grid to do that. That's one big change driver. But the other is simultaneously we're seeing the deployment of um, more and more distributed resources as you referred to that collectively can operate like a power plant. And um, this is not a case, at least I, at least I believe, of the federal government just aspiring to take over state jurisdiction. It's the technologies that distribution level, even customer level behind the meter technologies are now behaving like a power plant used to. And so we need to figure that out. And I believe those two phenomena, I think that the, the clearly the distributed technologies have a big state role, but they probably also have a federal role where they're aggregated and done over a region. And we just, are going to have to live in this period where those things are in tension because I see both of them continuing. Because if we're going to, if deep decarbonization down the road is the goal, we're going to need both the distributed and the big central station. And we're not replacing the nation's nukes, even if they were all continued, you know, they ultimately have a life and they're not being replaced in kind. So we have to figure what's the long term of the nation. It's probably more renewables and that's going to need both this big stuff and the little stuff. Um, yeah, thank you. That, that was very helpful. And, and I would just add that you know, we had a, there was a testimony in earlier this year at FERC on this, this aggregation question. And um, a lot of this is that you just need, tr one thing you fundamentally need is good transparency. Um, the, the grid, PGM, needs to know what is in, within the, the distribution system, what's sort of behind the meter. Uh, when you're talking about aggregation, whether it's distributed energy resources or demand response um, or EVs as increasingly to be deployed. Uh, I'd also note that these bring exceptional value to the system um, and they can, they can have a suppressive effect on price and, and impact um, the capacity. So um, they really do matter and they, it's, a, it's a brave new world. But uh, we do need to build the systems, and I think there's re reason to believe that it's not an impossible rubric or an empirical system to do, uh, to build the systems that would ensure that, that the grids understand that the, those, mark, those uh, aggregations are there and their contributions. There has to be much more real-time communication between like the transmission and the distribution control centers, but fortunately we live in an age of computers. Um, I mean, you can see how old I am, nobody else even calls them computers, but kind of huge <laughs> di digitization to do that. Yeah. And, and I just briefly add, and I think broadly agree with everything that was said, I, I think the, the point on regionalization is very accurate, and, and particularly as we're thinking about wind. Um, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of time in New Jersey, I mean, particularly with our colleagues in New York, but um, also kind of up and down the Atlantic coast, because um, look, this is a, a new industry um, that hasn't existed in the U.S. There's a lot of complicated issues, not only around uh, building these plants, but particularly transmission questions that are very complicated. Um, and we realize uh, there's no reason not to be thinking about this jointly. And so I think that regional effort does argue for the need for active engagement from the federal level. I just, um, I don't know that kind of the, the timelines that, you know, kind of the states and the, um, and that you all and, you know, the administration are able to operate under our, our aligned, but we'll see. It's a challenge. Well, if you look at a map, you know, the nation grew up around the rivers. All the population centers are on water, and that's where the power plants used to be, too. So everything was ducky. They'd be near the cities. But now the big resources are not necessarily near the population centers, so we have to figure that out.
Thank you. Um, so as an economist, you know, uh, it will be a disservice to, <laughs> to my profession if I don't ask about carbon pricing. So you know, all of you talked about carbon pricing. And uh, you know, we, we talked about, or you, know, you said, uh, most market compatible. And you know, any alter or in commissioner, uh, vice chairman uh, Place said, any alternative than market-based carbon pricing it, you know, that does not make sense. It is irrational. And we have a lot of economists in the room that says we need to price carbon. Uh, yet, it has not happened yet. So my first question is, how do we make carbon pricing happen? You know, what do we do? Do, uh, do we start at the ISO RTO level? Do we, you know, do we do legal, uh, you know, more you know, state level? How do, we, how do we push carbon pricing? Uh, the the follow-up question to that is, we know that carbon pricing is not going to happen tomorrow as much as we want. In the meantime, we have to, uh, we have to deal with the second best policies like ZEX and you know, other, other policies. So uh, how, how do we think about state policies that are second best, yet they're kind of a, you know, hopefully a filler until we get to the solution that uh, economists have been suggesting for the past 100 years? No pressure. <laughs> uh, well, I may as well jump into both feet. Um, hoping I'm not drown. Um, I think I'm an incrementalist by nature. Um, maybe Waxman Markey uh, was a salutary moment in my career where we looked for the holistic solution, the whole enchilada, and came up with empty hands. Um, and I, that was probably the epiphany for me that um, if we do this incrementally, piece by piece, uh, it's not ideal, and I lose a lot of sleep, understandably, that uh, well, we're, whether we'll ever get to uh, a point that is um, a appropriate, acceptable, um, and how long will it take us, and how much damage are we locking in before we get there. Uh, but that said, um, as a realist, um, I think, Chewing this up piece by piece, the, you know, the eat the elephant one bit at a time, is maybe the only practical way. And in some ways, it's a good way. Um, you know, we, we do see the states as good incubators of policy, and uh, the, and also the, the realization that getting anything overarching is is just it's just not going to happen. It's just, I just I just I can't even wrap my head around the possibility. But but also thinking about you know, for us in Pennsylvania, we've got this the 26 gigawatts of nuclear. Are we going to do something about it? Does that give us a moment to say, look, there is a disparate interest here, but can we find the a majority to get to a solution that says yes, we. Um, I want to do this for climate reasons, I want to do this for nuclear reasons, um, but we can, um, and we may come up with something suboptimal, but it's uh, the camel's nose under the tent moment. Um, and now also thinking about what we could do with revenue. If we, if Pennsylvania joined REG, uh, you could argue that's $500 million a year. Um, and how do we funnel that, those revenues back? Do we argue they go to vulnerable customers, vulnerable energy intensive industry, um, as well as um, energy efficiency and other measures that would mi mitigate the impact of, of that action. So um, that's a package for, from my perspective that, that matters and trying to get one bit at a time. And as I said, it's maybe the only reason, way forward, even if it's a suboptimal option. I think there's two macro problems standing in the way of climate, uh, of carbon pricing. The first is that um, there is not national consensus that climate change is a problem. There is the opposite of consensus, vast debate on this. Um, now, I just got back from Alaska and I saw it with my own eyes. Um, but if we, as a nation, said, hey, this is a big deal, we won World War II, we put a man on the moon, we can do this, we're going to roll up our sleeves and do it, but there, we're not there yet, and that's just the reality. Um, so um, that, if you want to know why there's not successful federal action, there's not a consensus among the parties that there's a problem, and that's a problem. 
So that's number one. And then there's also, but I'd say that's by far the biggest problem because if there was consensus, even if the federal government came up with a crappy solution, they'd at least be doing something, right? I mean, let's face it, it's not gonna be, I mean, rational might be too much to hope for, but at least there'd be a consensus we're trying to do something. There's not even a consensus, it's a problem. I had a congressman say to me when I make a comment, I mean, in a hearing, you know, that you, um, there, we, ha we have to do X, Y, Z, whatever it was, because Congress hasn't acted on climate change. And he, a very informed congressman on the energy, House Energy Committee said, we did act on climate change. Not passing the law was our action. That's what we think. And I mean, it kind of made my blood boil, but it also was accurate that they acted. So that's problem number one, and that's a big one. Problem number two, which is, also big, but subsidiary is, as I said before, we had this complicated ecosystem. So if you see PJM with their 13 states, they can't even get the initials, the acronym states <laughs> free. Um, and they have their 13 states. One, some are like Kentucky and West Virginia, and others are like New Jersey and Maryland. And um, I guess, can we still say Maryland is one of the green states? Whatever, you pick your two that you think. And um, they're trying to come together, and so, Things, so we're seeing more progress. That's why New York right now with a single state market is, seems to be a little closer on track. That's less of a problem than, not a, than the lack of consensus that it's an issue because that one's fundamental. Um, there's probably all kinds of implementation issues, but those are big. We need to get together on even solving it then we can start to do our wrong solutions. So in the meantime, of course increment, in my opinion, incremental is better than nothing but it depends on how big of a problem you think it is and how much faster the problem is going than the solution. Yeah, yeah and I mean, I guess I would say that recognize, I think probably most folks in this room recognize the you know, ideal uh, kind of problem solving uh, nature of a price on carbon. And you know, I really, I think, all of us in our own capacities should, you know, continue to work toward that. But I think the reality, you know, especially for and kind of kind of sitting where where we do, particularly in the states. I mean, you've got to, you know, start from where you are and, and the realities of where you are. I mean, for us in New Jersey, um, we. Uh, you know, kind of as I described, we wanted to really um, be an active participant in this conversation. The first place for us, and that is Reggie, right? I mean, and granted, yeah, you know, we talk about, um, you know, where where prices are right there, and is that the answer right now? It's it's not, but it does um, help us learn how to do it, right? And um, you know, our our um, our ZEC program similarly um, is it the you know kind of the top best solution uh, to the climate challenge. You know, you might from economist perspective argue no, but from what we were facing, which was the real and imminent closure of. Uh, you know, potentially 40% of our carbon-free generation in the state, that wasn't something that we were ready to contemplate. And so from a New Jersey perspective, um, mm -hmm. if you are really trying to contribute to the climate solution and, and drive a low-carbon economy, that wasn't an option for us. And so I think, you know, when you're dealing with this set of states, everyone is coming at it from a different place, and yeah, I mean, Kentucky is going to approach it differently than New Jersey is, but to some extent, until we get to the point, which I just have to keep believing that someday we will, that you get that federal consensus, it does feel like it's going to be a bit of a coalition of the willing and, and an opt-in process, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll work to obviously grow that group as we go, but um, I do think that it's important to kind of meet states where they are. Um, and be able to recognize the, um, the best policy solutions that they can find to move the conversation forward. Okay. Thank you for that. So unfortunately, we're running out of time as much as I would like to keep you here all day. So I'm going to ask uh, a uh, lightning round questions. I'm going to ask three questions and just really quick uh, one uh, word or one, uh, one sentence answers. <laughs> Um, so the first one is, if you had a magic policy wand that gives you the ability to implement one policy immediately, what would that be? No hearings, no rehearings, and, you know, just you can implement it today, right now. What is one advice you would uh, give to states trying to advance their uh, clean energy policies 
And what is your one biggest challenge in pursuit of rationality? <laughs> Should I call on people? <laughs> Test questions. Um, I mean, I mean, maybe the answer to to one from all of us. I mean, I think we've all pretty much answered, right? I mean, I think yeah. you know, price on carbon um, is probably um, the thing that you know, likely all of us would would snap our fingers if we could. Um, uh, in terms of what was number two on clean energy policy recommendation? One advice to states. Advice to advice to states. Um, the, yeah. um, one, um, you know, one real challenge for us, and I, I know, you know, Pennsylvania is in a similar boat, but um, is the real um, desire to move forward aggressively on these clean energy policies while also being incredibly considerate of consumer impact um, and the affordability questions um, that we both touched on. Um, it's real, it's significant. These are decisions that impact real people and real families. Um, and the, the tension between um, you know, all these issues, uh, it's, it's not that, it's, you know, that they're irreconcilable, but they do have to be seriously considered. Um, and that's something that you know, we're working um, hard on. I was really encouraged to hear some of what uh, innovative ideas that you all have in Pennsylvania that I'm um, excited to go home and, and talk to folks about too. Um, but that's one that I just highlight um, is worth continued attention as we um, move forward uh, because I think we all we all know that these um, you know these efforts aren't uh, don't contradict each other but we have to be really thoughtful um, as we move forward to make sure that we're making the best decisions to allow you know the progress that is happening at these states to to be applicable and relevant for others. So the first question is if I had one magic wand, definitely federal level climate policy. It can be cap and trade, it can be a carbon tax, but something federal that would be overarching and then we could work under that. Or it could be a long-term goal like Canada has, another hydrocarbon economy, but, but some kind of federal overarching thing that other things could fit in so we didn't have to build it up from the bottom. It's a question, advice to states or the biggest challenge to rationality? Uh, two uh, questions, so they're safe. both questions. Okay, <laughs> all right, so my advice to, the, well, you know, where you stand depends on where you sit. So now that I'm federal, uh, <laughs> my advice to states is to work together because the, the, ra the regionalization has had a lot of benefits for customers. And, um, you know, I had a colleague who said to call energy balkanized is an insult to Macedonia. Um, <laughs> you know, we, if we go back to our corners, it's not in the long run good for a lot of things. Um, and the biggest um, challenge to rationality, the politics and the election cycle. Thank you, right, Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I feel at the, the tail end here, everything important has been said, and I thoroughly agree with everything that was put forward, um, except with the one proviso that, yeah, I get the balkanization. I, I spent a lot of time in Macedonia. It's a lovely spot. Um, you're, you're one of the bigger, I mean, you're number two in this and number three in that, but think if you were Delaware. I mean, just say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I didn't put those numbers out there to be braggadocious. I mean, it just speaks to... It's, you know, <laughs> where the people breaking all the China. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but but I but I also um, I see I see progress intermittent progress as a value in and of itself. Just um, just keep moving the ball down the road. And um, yeah, it's complex. It's messy. It's ugly. But we can deal rationally with complex and messy and ugly at times. Um, and uh, rather than looking, again, the same guy who told me about um, being not, not stupid enough to say no, um, said, don't let the perfect be in the way of the good, get in the way of the good. Um, and, um, um, but yeah, you pointed about election cycles. And it, it's, it, I, I, it's hard to verbalize it, but just, just the, the lack of heft that science and data um, 
brings to these conversations is often troubling, whether it's siting or it's uh, low income issues or it's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you just, there's just n never the gravitas that needs to come from, this is what science is telling us, this is what the data is telling us. And that, that's obviously deeply troubling. Thank you for those answers. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel. This is fabulous.